Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is the phenomenal Oscar-nominated Oscar actor from such films as 12 Years a Slave, Inside Man, The Martian, Triple Nine. And now, uh, Truetel Ejiofor can add director to his resume with the new film, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's the story of Will Kamkwamba, who as a boy in Malawi built a wind turbine using recycled materials on his family's farm. Let's take a look. How does it feel, William? I never went to secondary school. Make us proud. Hey, <laughs> looking sharp, eh? You too, man. <laughs> Kachukolo is not the wealthiest school in the district, but it's down to each one of you to decide your own level of commitment. Commitment! The rains came late this year, and now the trees have gone. Malawi is preparing for a very long, hungry season. What are you going to do? Anything new? It's a pump. Can you fix it? Maybe. Mr. Kachibunda, when you turn the wheel on your bike, the light shines. How? It's magnets. I can bring water. I know how to do it. We stay, we die. No. With the electricity, we can plant in the dry season. And to a cook for a good zero, as a minute. Zita <laughs> Kuta, Everybody put your hands together for True Tell Edgy for Let's hear it. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure, thank you. First and foremost, congratulations. Thank you. You've directed your first movie. That's true. And you've made a very good one at that as well. Thank you. But you have made a movie yourself. Congratulations. It is a very hard thing to do. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, uh, so what, why this story? When you, you know it's a hard thing to do. You've been around filmmakers who've struggled to get movies made. I'm sure you've been a part of projects that have fallen through. You know it's really hard to get a movie made. And once you're making it, it's also hard there as well. Sure. So why this story? What was it about William Kamkwamba that inspired you? Um, well, uh, so many things. You know, I, uh, I read the book in uh, about 2009 when it, when it came out. Um, and I was, you know, just deeply stunned by the by his story, by um, by this boy who um, William Kabwamba at that point was thirteen, and with that kind of tenacity, ingenuity, um, the capacity to really face down these almost inconceivable struggles that him and his community were going through during that period of history in in Malawi, uh, and that that the famine that hit Malawi at that time. And uh, I was just completely inspired by him, uh, inspired by a young boy really living in the solution, the nature of education, technology, um, you know, and then this sort of wider principle that is part of the film, there's these kind of dynamics, the family dynamics, and, uh, and then this, um, this, um, this wider world, these sort of social dynamics, and then the global dynamics, you know, um, the, the film, and his story talks about sort of everything that you know that we are dealing with here. When I read the book, of course, it was about just after the financial collapse, and this idea that this um, this famine was really generated by 
uh, a lack of regulation with, with grain prices. So when there was a bad harvest, the grain prices went through the roof. And, and so it was a sense that these, the things that people were dealing with in Malawi were in this kind of microcosm, but we were all sort of dealing with the larger implications of that. And of course, climate change and the fact that the, um, the, the, um, you know, the deforestation the ideas that the environment were being kind of um, were the, the you know the environment changing and the climate changing and not being able to rely on rains and all of these different things that we are as a global community wrestle with, but in this kind of very specific way, people at the sharp end of the stick, you know, um, um, are really were really suffering, and it just inspired me to to really engage with William's story and to try and, and to try and tell his story and, and sort of bring it to a wider audience. Was it also the fact that there was an inspiring component to his story that you could tackle all of these sort of macro subjects in a very microcosm way that also had a somewhat inspirational bend to it? I thought it was just so optimistic. Yeah. You know, I thought it was so hopeful. Optimistic is a better word. I feel like inspirational has gotten uh, cliche in some way, but I didn't mean it that way. Optimistic is better. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, it is both, you know, <laughs> and it's, uh, and, uh, but it is. It's, it's, um, but like I say, it's just somebody who is able to, um, to interpret the, the situation and, and to look beyond it, you know, in a way that is almost, I think in some ways almost unimaginable. You know, I, when I was it's like 13 when he does it, and usually when you're 13, you kind of just let the world happen to you. You know, there's a, there's a part in the book where he talks about sneaking into school, you know, and I, and I think that was the moment that everything kind of changed for me. You know, in his memoir, he's, he's trying to get into, he's, he's taken out of school because his family can't afford the fees. Secondary school isn't free in Malawi. And uh, so he starts sneaking into school. Uh, and, he, and that's where he actually finds the book, Using Energy, the American textbook, which has a picture of a windmill on the front of it. Um, and I thought about myself at 13 and whether it was conceivable to any degree that I would be sneaking into school, you know. And the understanding that, of course, I wouldn't be, you know. And this sort of idea of that sense of privilege and that sense of the world and its inversion, you know, of what a kind of different life that is. And, uh, and that, the idea of that kind of even distribution of talent, but not of opportunity. And a boy at that age trying to sneak into a school in order to learn about a way that he might be able to help his community was so deeply inspiring to me, you know, so moving to me that I, um, that I wanted to try and tell his story. Now, when you set out to make the film, um, you know, you shoot it in Malawi. In lots of the scenes, you were speaking the, the language native to uh, those in Malawi. Chichula? Chichua, yeah. Chichua, yes, I remember it. He told me in the green. I kind of <laughs> got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm constantly. <laughs> um, what, was there a part of you that wanted to sort of set up a bunch of ways to make this inspiring for you and to make you have to kind of work as hard as possible as a filmmaker? It was just, I think it was... Um, or just the right way to do it. Well, it's kind of incremental, isn't it? You know, I wanted to tell the story, but I wanted to make sure that it was as deeply authentic as I could make it, you know? And so that's why I made the decision to shoot him in Malawi. Uh, and then we were going to shoot in all of the, uh, as much as we could in all of the real locations, you know, that the events actually took place. And I wanted to shoot in William's house, actually. Um, but um, he had done so much innovation in his house over the years, you know, that it didn't look anything like it did, you know, <laughs> back then. So, uh, so we shot in his next door neighbor's house, for example, right in Wimbe, right in the village where he's, where he's from. And so in that process, you know, the next step was clearly to start thinking, well, how are we going to, you know, what are we going to, how are we going to speak? You know, what are we going to say? You know, how do we, how do we balance that? You know, obviously people in the village speak to Chewa. Um, you know, and, they, and people speak English in other circumstances. They might speak English in school or in uh, you know, sort of work environments and stuff like that. But in the village at home, you speak to Chewa. So it became a process. Well, that was the next logical step. That the, Those of us who weren't from Malawi, there were people cast who are from Malawi, several people cast from Malawi. But those who weren't, you know, we started to learn Chewa so we could do the scenes, you know, sort of authentically, those scenes that, are, that required that. So... That was the process, really. It was just that one decision, the one clear decision of trying to reach for a very deep authenticity in the story, um, and then you know what the implications of that were. Were you always going to direct it from the start? Like you got this and you developed it, and it was going to be your your first feature film that you were directing? Cause, or because you know, oftentimes you hear stories like an actor is attached to something, and then the director falls through, and the actor steps up because they know the project better than anybody else. Or was this from the get-go, like your passion project that you wanted to direct? Yeah, I think the way that I remember it, I mean, 
Andrea Calderwood, who produced the film, sort of seems to think that that was the case, that I was going to do it right from the beginning. But I kind of remember it slightly differently, that I was, uh, that I was kind of writing the film, and I was going to, you know, and, and I just wanted to you know, adapt to the film, uh, adapt the book, and then, and then see, you know, you know, as it was developing, what would happen, and whether that would be for somebody else to direct, or for me to direct, whether I would play Trywell, whether I wouldn't, um, and those sorts of decisions. But... Um, it became quite clear at a certain point. You know, I was traveling back and forth to Malawi a lot, and uh, and I was making decisions, thinking about the landscape. I was writing with the locations in mind. By the time I started to do some of the later drafts, and uh, and those were became directorial decisions. They became uh, decisions about the the visuals, about how the how it would feel, and that kind of got buried into the sort of DNA of the script at a kind of earlier stage. And so... Is she such a good producer that she tricked you into directing? You know what, that might have been what happened. <laughs> like, when you weren't in the room, they're like, oh, no, he's directing, don't worry. He just needs some time, but he'll be directing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the old Jedi mind trick. <laughs> what was your biggest fear stepping into the director's chair? I think... Being in the director's chair, sorry. Yeah, I think that the, the kind of... What I was concerned about was just the the doing of it, you know, just how it, how it would feel on the floor, you know, um, to just the, the sort of rawness of that, to be directing something and then step into this sort of other space and be the character and then step out of that and try and be objective about what was happening and what, what I was doing and, um, you know, and what everybody else was doing. And it just felt like that was a really sort of strange process it would have been it was going to be very very new for me and i and i wondered how uncomfortable i'd feel in that in that space um when you're generally when you're acting and you're not directing how much do you stay and forgive the lack of a better way to put this because mm -hmm. i don't think it's really how people talk about acting but stay close to the character while on set or in character while on set I mean, I think that you kind of, it, it sort of depends. I, I, have a, I have a feeling you never really step fully out of, out of character. And even people that claim to, you know, who sort of say, oh, yeah, I did that really intense scene and now I'm cracking a joke over here. You know, they're not really. That cracking a joke bit is still part of the performance of whatever, you know, the, the nature of what they're trying to either step into or get away from is. It's not their just natural being, you know. So I feel like you hold it always when you're on set. And especially if you're doing intense stuff or if you're in any way concerned about your character, concerned about your performance, concerned about all of the dynamics on set, which you invariably are, you know, you're, you're holding all of that. You're holding all of that tension. You know what the next scene is. You know, you know how far you have till the next sort of intense moment in your preparation. You are holding where you are in the story at all points. So you are holding all of this information and you are to some degree in character, whether you're cracking jokes or not. So, uh, so losing that and entering into a totally different space of, you know, I guess... Um, we should have been on the next location, yeah. you know, 45 minutes ago. You know, are we going to lose the, the light, you know, at the last place? Uh, you know, is the rain machine going to work today? <laughs> you know, when you're in that space and thinking about those things, that is totally different from the space of being an actor, you know, from the space of being in, in performance in that kind of mode. So that's the complication, switching to those two sides of... Um, of, of the thought process. But there's also a performance to that thought process as well, the, the directorial side, because even though the, all of these compromises are taking place, you have to present yourself as in control and on top of it. And, you know, the, the leader of your crew, which is in a lot of ways a performance as well, because you are being told you're losing light. We needed to be there 45 minutes ago. The location's about to drop off. They want more money. All of these things. But then you also have to go act on camera as well. A different kind of performance. Yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of, it's sort of, there's a strange sort of balancing act. You know, the key to that, though, is who your collaborators are. Right. You know, that's, that's the sort of crucial point. You know, I realized quite early on that if I was sort of, ever feeling kind of panicked that I would look at uh, Dick Pope, the cinematographer, and if he looked panicked, then I would really worry, you know. But if he, but he never did seem to look He's panicked. Dick Pope. So like Stewart or stewardess sort of thing on the airplane with turbulence, you know. You're looking over there, they seem okay, well then it must be all right, you know. He was very 
calm and collected for most of it, and that that sort of eased that position. You know, he really helped me. You know, his, uh, you know, the amount of experience that he has as a cinematographer really took a lot of that pressure off me of the kind of the day to day pressure because he absorbed a lot of that. You know, Dick Pope, forgive me, uh, shot uh, most of Mike Lee's work. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay, that's that's what I thought. Yeah, he's an incredible cinematographer. It makes perfect sense. The cinematography in the film is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get him involved in the project? Well, um, were you a fan? Yeah, huge <laughs> fan. And I had, you know, one of the things that I had always thought about and talked about with the film was that the idea of the kind of the landscape. Um, you know, Dick Pope did made a film with Mike Lee, uh, Mr. Turner. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and I talked to you know whether you consider um, uh, Turner to be an impressionist or not. I, I had always talked about the nature of the impressionist painters and the way they depicted rural France, you know, and how they gave this sort of underclass, this sort of perceived sort of peasantry underclass, um, these, um, uh, and there's perceptions of people who were kind of lesser than or conceived that way or perceived to be that. Uh, and they gave them this real, and you know, the impressionist painters, the great ones, gave rural France and the peasant class, you know, this um, this epic status, mm -hmm. you know, and surrounded them in in beauty and and put them at the centre of their own kind of destiny in a way that was really empowering, truly empowering. And so when I was starting to conceive this project in this way, uh, visually, one of the things that I was talking about was. You know that it's about time that people in 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 rural communities in some of the poorer countries in the world were given the same kind of scale, the same sort of epic nature. You know, because these are really big lives, actually. You know, they're big lives with huge stakes and fit within the tradition of Western cinema, really, in a in a rare, in a very neat way, because of what they go through, the expansive nature of what they go through. So, um, so one of the things that I was drawn to with Dick Pope's work on Mr. Turner is exactly that, you know, the big skies, the huge landscapes, the sense of it all being a kind of painting and these people in the center of it and feeling that kind of power of being in the center of your own kind of destiny. So, um, so we started immediately kind of talking about that and, um, and he was um, just deeply engaged in the project. He spent a lot of time in various different African countries, you know, from the 60s and 70s, working in documentaries for the BBC. So he had a lot of awareness of, uh, of, of different places. He'd never been to Malawi, but, you know, he really had a feel and an energy for, um, for, uh, for shooting there. So, um, so that was how our sort of dynamic came about. I have to say, that makes sense now that you say it. Mm. Um, I didn't realize that it was Dick Pope when I was looking at it, but as soon as you said Dick Pope, I thought of Mr. Turner and the way that he turned those landscapes into paintings without being, oftentimes filmmakers try to turn landscapes into paintings when they make movies about painters and they go too far, they go overboard and it's like, that doesn't really look like a painting, that just looks like you're sort of bleeding colors on film or digitally, but he had a way of doing it and I think what I was complimenting you in the, in the green room, that opening scene in the woods the way that the yellow is used yeah. and the sort of um the the bright sunlight very much felt like an epic painting and it reminded me i don't think i thought of it in the moment but you say mr turner it kind of now that i think of it makes me think of mr turner and the way that he did it there yeah. no question just i'm happy that i've caught up yeah, with yeah, you no no, no, great. no no i'm glad to uh, yeah <laughs> Um, you know, in 2012, you were nominated for an Academy Award, right? For 12 Years a Slave? 2013, 2014? 14. Uh, anyway. <laughs> One of those. Give or take a couple of years. It was on June 6th. Yeah. Look, I ballparked my research. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, after something like that happens, especially a movie like that, you, you know, you're going to get a, a, a lot of asks to be in a lot of movies. You're going to get the chance to be in a lot of films for a lot of different people. You were already working a lot up until that point. But to then go and direct your own movie and to adapt it as well, that takes years off your life, off of a career that you have momentum in. Were you ever worried about that? How did you know that this was the right time to step back from acting and go, and not that you, you act in the movie, of course, but to adapt a movie, to direct a movie, to edit a movie, all of which takes a year, year and a half to do, a couple of years? Yeah, I mean, it just wasn't, um, it didn't really, I, it wasn't really a considered choice in that way mm -hmm. I, I just felt like I couldn't I couldn't not do it you know like I just felt like it was important to me uh, and so everything else became kind of simpler <laughs> you know in a way uh, it was just that I I sort of needed to to do this and I it was something that I felt incredibly passionate about and um and I wanted to um 
explore and engage with and try to see if I could find a way of, of, of bringing it out there. You know, I thought it was a, a very important story and, um, and, and a deeply hopeful one. And it was something that I had been sort of just very, very moved by and engaged with. And so it felt very natural for me to just to continue to, to pursue that, um, which is, uh, by the way, exactly how I feel about the projects as an actor that I really want to, really, I really want to work on. It's not really a, a massive calculation. It's just if I'm engaged, if I'm moved, um, you know, if I want to put my energy behind it, then that, then that's the decision, and uh, and then I sort of roll with it. You've worked with a number of great directors as an actor as well. You know, Steve McQueen, Alfonso Cuarón, Spike Lee. Um, what did you take from them going into this as a as a director? I mean, so much. You know, I think that you you pick up so many different things uh, along the way from different people, and um, you know, in the end, you got to find your own style of doing it. You know, that's very important. You're not you're not wearing anybody else's clothes when you go on there. But the idea being that there were certain things that I thought, well, you know, there were certain sort of very practical things that I remember um, thinking, you know. It, this is this is possible to do with this number of people and this number of like say background or extras or whatever you know that this uh, in this amount of time because on X film we did this and this and this and I remember that only taking like four hours so I'm sure we can get this shot in you know what I mean that sort of thing and so those kind of very practical but real moments you know of just knowing no actually this does work because I was actually on a thing where we did this you know is is incredibly helpful right it's know. less about direct influence and more about experience uh, totally it's vocational you know in the end and that kind of ex that kind of experience is uh um because that's the first i mean the one thing about being a first-time director is you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. you know so um and that's what causes the anxiety <laughs> you know um, and so as much as you can counteract that by actually just sort of knowing certain things for a fact, you know, um, it gives you a certain amount of confidence, especially if you're trying to do things like I was in this, which, you know, was, you know, kind of a big, there were some big numbers in the film. So, you know, if you've got, I think we had at one point almost a thousand extras, about a sort of thousand background, you know, on a, on a day and, you know, and, and trying to organize that and trying to shoot the scene and trying to get the footage and, you know, if there's a lot of moving parts and whatever, um, of course that can be quite intimidating if you've never been on either a set or a sequence of sets and different people sets where you've where that kind of thing has been attempted. You know, so that was that was a great advantage for me going in. So, what was that day like where you had a, a thousand background? I could write a book on it. <laughs> it was, really? <laughs> yeah, it was really intense. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually two days for the presidential rally in the in the middle in the middle sequence of the film, and it was um, it was. You know, it was just so full on because there was so much to accomplish. There were so many moving parts. There was so much sort of narrative story to get through uh, and to sort of understand. But at the same time, we were trying to sort of harness and generate this all of this energy from this crowd of like a thousand people, who, most of whom had never been on a, a film set before. But one great advantage was that they were all aware of these events, the specific events that that part of the film talks about is a part of the history of Malawi. So everybody was aware of the events and that we were recreating those events. And so it was a very fascinating, interesting time, you know, especially because they were also political events. And so there were different people there from different political parties and, and that sort of energy and, you know, people who had different points of view of what was happening. And, so there was a whole host of things that were very, um, that were very, very interesting. At any point, did your, were you approached by a PA or an AD or a second AD? They're like, uh, Mr. Ejiofor, uh, there's someone in the uh, background that'd like to talk to you about the politics of this situation or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of opinions that people have. Yeah, the, I mean, I certainly had to sort of chat it through. With background people, always know. has opinions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, somebody there, you know, has 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 a thought or two about it. Background know. is always going. What is this guy doing? What is yeah. it? here? They're doing that. I can't imagine. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think there's some time for audience questions. Uh, who has a question right here? Hi. Hi, I'm a big fan of your work. I wanted to say I really loved your performance in the movie Salt. Nice. And I wanted to know, being that the, the, the roles that are for black people now, do you think more black actors are getting a chance now? And being with Spike Lee just winning his first Oscar, do you think more black actors and directors are being celebrated for their work now? 
Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that um, you know the awards this uh, this past weekend we really showed that there is a, a, an appetite for a very diverse amount of um, of film and cinema, and there's an appetite for it amongst people who are watching movies and are going to films, and that's a, 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 an amazing sort of step forward. I think. A lot of us were always aware that that was there, but it was kind of, um, it was sort of suggested somehow that um, the, the audiences weren't engaged with those things, you know? Um, and so that kind of being disproved is important. And I think that, um, that audiences are engaged with telling stories from different points of view, from different backgrounds, from different understandings, because they understand that it enriches our overall cultural space. <laughs> the way that we relate to each other and understand each other is improved by having art perform that function as well. So, um, so I think as that continues, and I hope it does, that, uh, that it does provide many more opportunities for black artists to, to do their work and to showcase their work and to, um, and to, to get into that, yeah. Uh, one more. Hi. Uh, I, my question is, what moral or lesson do you hope audiences will take away from such an optimistic film as The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind? Well, I think there's, um, thank you, I think there's a lot. You know, I think that, yeah, that it is um, optimistic. It is incredibly hopeful. Um, and it, I think at the end it talks about uh, sort of two things at its core. You know, it talks, it talks about an, an individual spirit, an individual kind of capacity, but it also talks about that within the nature of a supportive society, you know. And that is, uh, I think, the, the, the key thing. The individualism can only get us so far. You know, it's all very white and good, you know, being an individual and that kind of energy that has been propagated for so long of this kind of individualist mentality is fine, you know, but we do need a, a cohesive society, you know, and we do want that with common values. And that is um, part of um, part of the story, that, that we are kind of very, very connected and can support each other. And then, you know, people like William Kamkwamba can do sort of amazing things, but it is a sort of moral for, for us all. Thank you. The film comes to Netflix this Friday, right? All across the world, people can watch The That's Boy Who right. Harnessed yeah. the Wind. Uh, it's beautiful, incredible work. Congratulations on the film. Chuatel Ejiofor, everybody. Let's hear it. Thank you.